to discuss it. Ideally, one identifying as a woman and one identifying as a man to participate in the discussion today. And today is one of those monthly Tuesdays where I have a meeting at 10 a.m. I can't be late. I could get fired, so I need two volunteers to protect my <laughs> job this morning so that we um, can finish on time. Um, and hi, Rafa, let me make you a co-host. So do we have two volunteers? I think someone said um, we have a case. Gabrielle, you have a case, is that right? Amazing, we have a case from Gabrielle. That will be awesome. And do we have two volunteers? Ideally one identifying as a woman and one identifying as a man. Please, please. Let's break our record of waiting 10 minutes to find a volunteer. We have 20 of you, so we just need 10% volunteer rate today would be phenomenal. Who would like to discuss a neurology case with me? It will be a lot of fun. Maria and Rafa and Gabrielle are gonna be helping out. Why don't you introduce yourselves and try to generate some enthusiasm? So, because I have been relatively unsuccessful so far, all as prior discussants and presenters and general fans of neurology VMR. Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel. I'm a medical student from Peru. Very excited to be here today. Um, right now I'm doing, I'm starting my neurology rotation and I had a case I wanted to share with you guys. It's nothing complicated, so please, please volunteer and I promise you will have a great time. All right. We have a great case from Gabriel from his rotation in Peru. Who would like to discuss this case? We would love to have Two volunteers. Gabrielle and I feel so lonely here in these little two-dimensional boxes. No one wants to talk with us this morning. Every Tuesday, <laughs> we do the dance. How's the weather there in Peru, Gabrielle? <laughs> Oh, we are starting in spring, so it's it's getting kind of hot, but really okay. awesome. Well, I think Great. Hans volunteered. Welcome, Hans. Great. We have Hans and someone else volunteered. Did I miss it? Danny, you're going to volunteer also. This is like. So yeah, Maria, Ma Maria decided, uh, Maria offered to scribe and said that if I want to discuss, she's here to help. And I haven't discussed in forever, but I thought I'd give it a try today. We are so happy and thank you for your encouragement behind the scenes, Maria. Um, great, um, Danya and Hans, do you wanna introduce yourselves? Tell us where you're from and we will get started before 9, 10, I'm so happy. Great. Should I go first or should would Hans like to introduce himself? Go ahead, Danya. Great. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is uh, Danya Rizwan. I'm from Pakistan. I graduated uh, from medical school in 2019. Then I did a year of internship. And currently, I am um, teaching as a demonstrator in a medical college and also preparing for step one. And I'm a part of CP Solvers. I've recently joined in and I'm really excited to discuss today. Great. Thank you for joining us today. And Hans? Yes, and I'm a medical graduate <clears throat> as well. And right now I'm in Canada, back home again, where I'm volunteering in the hospital. And just occasionally I can help out in a pharmacy. So that's, and of course I'm with, um, the problem solvers. I like the VMR. Great. I'm so happy to have you both discussing this case this morning. And so Maria, you're going to be running all things screens. Fantastic. Um, do you want to say hi? I think people know you, but go ahead. Yes, I'm so happy, Dania. I kind of pushed her into volunteering. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, so I'll be scribing. I'm from Guatemala. I love neurology. And Rafa is actually going to be doing teaching for us. Oh yeah, you want to say hi also, Rafa? You two are both famous clinical problem solvers, but just in case anyone is new. 
I don't know if I'm famous, but my name is Samuel. <laughs> I'm a medical student from Brazil and always excited to be here with you guys. Fantastic. In our virtual CP solvers world, you both are famous, at least to me. Yeah. Okay, great. So, Gabrielle, do you want to give us just the chief concern, chief complaint for our discussants? And we're starting at 9.09. .09. Next week, 9.08. 907 by the new year, I want to <laughs> volunteer before 905. It's going to happen. Danya sure. and Hans will be inspiring everyone. Go ahead. The, shift, the shift complaint is headaches for four months. Headaches for four months. Okay. Danya, when you hear these few words, what starts coming to your mind? All right. Um, whenever I um, hear about a complaint of headaches, I would. I usually want to know about the age of the patient, um, also about the location of the headache, uh, the type of the headache that the patient has. So let's say if a patient is young and they have been having these headache for four months, I would like to um, see if the patient has had uh, these headaches uh, previously as well. Maybe it is, uh, maybe the patient has a history of migraine or uh, maybe this is um, a stress headache. So I, I maybe uh, the with the location of the headache and the type of the headache, I'd be able to rule those um, common complaints um, or common uh, diagnosis of headaches out. Um, moreover, I would like to um, later on. I would like to um, uh, know about any other associated complaints. Maybe there with the headache, the patient has any prior to the headache, the patient has any um, aura or nausea, vomiting, any photophobia, you know. Um, what about uh, during the headache? Does the patient have any associated uh, sensory uh, deficit with it? Maybe the patient has difficulty in, I don't know, vision maybe. Um, not sure what maybe the patient also has like um, nausea vomiting and the headache is probably associated with increased intracranial pressure stuff like that i think this is what i have so far with the headache great phenomenal discussion danya so yeah we want to know about the characteristics of the headache itself is one aspect you mentioned and with those characteristics does it fit into a particular headache syndrome um, in the category of primary headaches, which we can talk more about. And you gave us um, some of those clues, right? You told us about migraine, which is usually unilateral, though not always. The, ca the quality of the pain is usually pulsating, right? It's um, often associated with nausea, vomiting. The aura, you described the visual aura, or there can be all kinds of auras. If that becomes relevant here, we can, we can talk about auras, but it's actually only present in about 20 to 25% of um, patients. You can have migraine with aura, migraine without aura. Patients might not have an aura with every migraine. Um, sometimes patients have an aura with no headache afterwards called acephalgic migraine, which can be very confusing, especially a first presentation can look even like a stroke sometimes. So great. Um, that's a great initial um, set of questions we're going to be having our antenna up for during the history. And then um, uh, Hans, do you want to um, say what's going through your mind? And then I'll talk a little bit how I'm thinking about headache. Yes. <clears throat> Danielle already mentioned migraine headache, possibly cluster headaches. We need to ask for any associated symptoms, as well as tension headaches. And of course, we would like to know the time course. Here we know it's been going on for four months. And of course, whether she had headaches before. And then, of course, anything that makes the headache better and worse, we would like to ask during um, our HPI. And then of course we need to look at red flags, which um, is it a headache which is so bad at times that we might think about a mass occupying lesion in her brain, about a vascular problem, anything that could raise any um, red flags infections, maybe there are some associated things going on, autoimmune, and so on. Great, Hans, great um, discussion and great um, discussion from both of you, sort of, um, Danya taking us through some of the things that might make us think of a primary headache disorder, like migraine or tension, and Hans uh, making us, uh, talking us through some things that might make us think of a secondary headache disorder, the so-called red flags. So yeah, I think um, sort of synthesizing some of what um, both of you said when I first hear about headaches, the first thing I'm trying to determine um, in my mind and then through the history and exam is, is this a primary headache disorder or a secondary headache disorder? 
where the primary headache disorders are, as Daniel Hans mentioned, disorders like migraine headache, tension headache, Cluster headache is always on step one, isn't it? But it's actually super rare. I think in over 10 years now, I've seen maybe one or two cases, not very common. These, But these are sort of the common primary headache disorders, meaning they have some pathophysiology. People are very interested in the pathophysiology of migraine in particular, but there's no secondary disorder causing the headache. There's no mass, there's no stroke, there's no meningitis, et cetera. So we have primary headache disorders and as you're hearing the history, um, you're also want to keep in the back, well, I was going to say back in the mind, but front of your mind, right? Could this be a secondary headache disorder, meaning that the patient has headache as a symptom, but the cause is not a primary headache disorder. And, and it's what we call the red flags um, in the history that make us think of that. So what are some things that can cause secondary headaches? Well, open your medicine textbook and just, you know, scroll through it like a deck of cards and put your finger in and you'll find you'll stop on a page and is there a cause of headache on that page? Probably, right? So the list is extremely long of things that can cause headache. The way I usually divide it up are um, things inside the head, things of the head and neck um, or systemic conditions. So just to have three broad categories. So inside the head, we have the brain, we have the meninges, we have the vessels. So we can think about subarachnoid hemorrhage and uh, intracerebral hemorrhage and meningitis and brain abscess and brain tumor and um, all sorts of things inside the head. Then we have of the head and neck, right? So patients with eye problems can present with headache, ear problems, sinus problems, nose problems, dental problems, neck problems, um, all of those can um, present with headache. And then systemic conditions, right? We've all had a viral upper respiratory illness that had a headache with it. Um, I certainly had a bad headache after my COVID vaccine. And I always wonder, what is that headache? Is there some mild inflammation of my meninges or is that just I'm dehydrated or just there's cytokines around and and the meninges don't like it or what's what's going on up there but um, there's a huge differential right but just to, to keep it broad as we go through the history trying to get a sense are there any red flags for the secondary causes so let's work through some of those um, red flags so Hans mentioned some but um, Danya or Hans anyone can feel free to chime in so one concerning type of condition that could cause a headache um, would be a vascular condition. And what characteristics of the headache or what red flags would you be looking for in the history that may, might make you think, oh, I'm worried about the, uh, a vascular etiology here? Yes, uh, what might make me think about a vascular uh, etiology would be that it's ongoing, pulsating, and that it has become worse than what she had in the past. So that could be an aneurysm probably, which is somehow pressing against the structure. Okay, yeah, so, um, so pulsating is difficult because um, migraine um, can pulsate also. And as with anything, I think last we were talking about seizure versus syncope, we went through all the classic things that divide them and then we debunked all of them as potentially there um, either. Probably the main red flag for a vascular etiology we would think about would be a sudden onset headache, a so-called thunderclap headache or worst headache of, of one's life. Um, because blood in or around the brain usually is coming out pretty suddenly from an arterial structure. If it's an aneurysm, uh, subarachnoid um, hemorrhage, for example, um, that would be very concerning. Vasospasm in the condition reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome or RCVS, which can be caused by um, marijuana, can be caused by um, uh, amphetamines, can be caused by cough syrups that have um, certain stimulants, or I forget what it is in cough syrups, this can be caused by licorice. I saw one case, excessive licorice consumption um, causing this. So um, vascular um, etiologies, usually you think of sudden. The patient is all of a sudden feels like they were hit in the head um, with something. Um, another thing you mentioned earlier, Hans, was a mass. So um, what types of features on the history would make you worried about a mass um, lesion? Because it's been going on for a long time. Now, I don't know the exact time course in the sense of was it a very mild headache at first and then getting worse over time. But the fact that it's over four months might perhaps be a mass or anything else. Yeah, so pro progressive headaches are one red flag, right? That uh, um, Danya and Hans both mentioned earlier that things like migraine and tension, by the time the patient sees you in the office, they've had it and it's gotten completely better and they're normal in between. Um, that might make one a um, little less concerned for a mass lesion that could be progressive. Um, anything else? Do you, um, any other red flags you think of, Danya? And then I can add some also. 
Yeah, I believe um, nausea and vomiting because uh, if uh, any mass is present in, and if there's a space occupying lesion, it might compress on um, the ventricles, maybe cause hydrocephalus or increased uh, intracranial pressure leading to nausea and vomiting. Yeah, so nausea, vomiting, another tricky one, right? When elevated, uh, when the intracranial pressure is elevated, that can cause nausea and vomiting, but migraine can also cause nausea and vomiting, right? So that's a little bit um, tricky. So um, important signs for elevated intracranial um, pressure and then some type of mass um, causing this headache or pseudotumor uh, cerebri causing this headache. Um, one is that the timing of the headaches, that they can be worse first thing in the morning or they can wake the patient up from sleep. And this is what I call brain orthopnea, right? We all know from medicine when the patient has heart failure and they lie down, all that venous return comes to their heart and they get paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or orthopnea. And in the brain, we have all the cerebrospinal fluid that's circulating around the brain and spine, right? And when we are standing up, gravity is helping some of that be in the spinal column. When we lie down, it's more in equilibrium because gravity is taken out of the equation. And if our intracranial pressure is normal, no problem to get a little extra CSF up there if we're lying down or doing yoga and doing a headstand or whatever. But if there's elevated intracranial pressure, that sort of um, increase on top of that of the CSF sort of returning from the um, spine can uh, cause things to be worse in the supine position. So the patient may say the headaches are worse first thing in the morning. That's always concerning. Or they wake them at night. But I have had patients with primary headache disorders who are awakened at night. So as far as the red flags, I divide them into characteristics of the headache. So we've talked about a thunderclap headache, a pervasive headache, a headache that's changed from the usual headaches if the patient has a headache history, um, a headache that's um, coming on at night or first thing in the morning, um, that's worse with coughing, sneezing, valsalva, um, exercise. Those are all, again, things that might make you think of intracranial pressure, exercise, um, maybe even an aneurysm. Um, and then context is the other important piece, right? So headache in a patient with HIV, we might worry about a opportunistic infection, although HIV itself can cause sort of a primary headache disorder. Headache in a patient with a history of cancer, you might worry about metastases, right? So I think about characteristics of the headache and then context of the patient that would make me worry about uh, secondary headache disorders. So right, so as we're listening to this history, we're gonna wanna get a sense we have a time course here. As you've said, is this a headache that's progressive for four months? Who is the patient, right? Are they younger, older? What past medical history do they have? What are the characteristics of that headache? How did it come on? Um, how does it change? What are the associated um, symptoms? We talked about nausea and vomiting, which can sort of go either way. Are there focal neurologic symptoms, seizures? Um, is there fever, right? It'll make you think of infection. So um, I think the history will be um, very illuminating uh, here. So great um, discussion, Danyan Hans, to get us sort of off the ground here, thinking about primary and secondary headache disorders. And on the secondary side, are there red flags to make us think of that? On the primary side, if there are no red flags, can we drill down, as Danya said, based on the characteristics of the headache? Is this a migraine? Is this a tension headache? Is this cluster, which is rare? And then there are tons of other primary headache disorders. Cluster falls under a larger family called the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. There's something called sunct, sudden onset unilateral headache with nasal congestion and tearing and suna. And there is um, paroxysmal hemicrania and hemicrania continua and numbular. <laughs> There's this thing called the ICHD, the International Classification of Headache Disorders. I call it the taxonomy of flowering plants of headache disorders because there's just thousands of these headaches that people have described and seen enough patients with them to say this is a, a syndrome, but we don't really know. It's like the DSM-5 for headache, right? It's a description of the patient has these things, doesn't have these things, can have two of these things, and we call it this condition, but no biomarker. Okay, so let's see what happens in this HPI and um, if we're primary, secondary headache disorder and go from there. Okay, Gabrielle, thank you for those stimulating four words. Can we have a few more words, please? Sure. So this is a 39-year-old female that presents to the neurology department with headaches. Four months before, after sleeping, she noticed out of the blue a pulsatil unilateral pain localized to the left occipital region that radiates through the, through the retroricular and temporal area. During the four months, the patient describes the pain as constant of throbbing nature with superimposed acute exacerbation increasing in severity and frequency. During the exacerbation, she happens to have a profound rhinorrhea on the left side and near fullness with on the, also on the 
left side with malphotophobia and phonophobia. Okay, we're just um, listening to you and then um, reading here. Uh, up to you, should we, would you like us to discuss now, Gabrielle, or do you want to fill in to young patient? Um, do you want to leave the other stuff in the bottom left yeah, corner out um, or do you it, just add it on? Up to you. It's, it's a, a short case, so the aliquot 3 will be um, the medical history, more information, and the aliquot number 4 will be the physical exam. Sam and okay. the don't tell me anymore. Don't tell me yeah. anymore. Don't tell me anymore. Okay. <laughs> Once I know what test you get, then I'll I don't want to be um biased. Okay, so we'll we'll take this as as this aliquot. Okay. I think you were first last time, Danya. So Hans will have you discuss this aliquot and Danya um the next one. So what what do you um make of this, Hans? What what are you thinking? Oop, you're muted, Hans. Sorry. Rhinorrhea and earfulness. I thought about um possibility of an infection like a sinusitis that could be pressing in this area. It also looks a little bit like a cluster headache, but that would probably improve and wouldn't be constant over such a long period of time if I'm correct, but I might be wrong here. And of, so at this point, I was almost thinking about something like infectious because it's a rhinorrhea and earfulness. That could be a congestion of, you know, maybe pass in the sinuses or even in the ear, something like a middle ear infection, but then she would an earache. Yeah, so there's a lot of um, details here, right? So there's the fact that there is rhinorrhea and ear fullness. And if I understood, Gabrielle, that's just during the exacerbation. So there's a constant background of headache for four months with exacerbations. And during that, um, there are these superimposed um, symptoms. So yeah, if you heard headache and then, um, nasal congestion or rhinorrhea, you can get these so-called trigeminal autonomic um, symptoms in migraine or in, in cluster where there's tearing and nasal congestion. Actually, a lot of patients with migraine are misdiagnosed as having had sinus um, headaches. They're, 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 um, until someone you know, um, digs into the history and says, oh yeah, you can get you know, um, nasal congestion with migraine and you can get tearing with migraine. Um, the ear fullness um, for migraine, that would be, as you said, a little atypical. So is there some sort of chronic ear condition going on here? And if so, um, has that led to some type of neurologic complication there? Um, it is possible for otitis um, to spread to the meninges and cause meningitis, although that's uh, almost always bacterial. And uh, for someone to have bacterial meningitis for four months um, would not be um, uh, here to tell the tale, right? So I think um, unless that ear thing is relatively um, indolent and um, has been causing some sort of background um, headaches. And then finally the process has made its way to the meninges and the acute presentation now is um, meningitis. That may be one way to, to string those things together. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, what else can we, can we do here? Um, any thoughts on this, Danya? We're okay with time. There's a lot here, so let's both discuss it. Yeah, any other additional thoughts that you have? Yeah, I was... Um... Uh, I had very similar thought, thoughts to Hans regarding cluster headache and migraine because of the rhinorrhea that the patient has presented with. But I'm also thinking about maybe, um, I'm not sure, I don't have enough information regarding headaches, but like uh, whenever we discuss trigeminal neuralgia and we talk about unilateral pain that is extremely severe and worsens on um, a touch, maybe this is some sort of neuralgia that is involving, I don't know, a ganglion because it says retro auricular um, radiation and then temporal area and then I don't know where I'm going with this but okay yeah. good so so yeah there's trigeminal neuralgia right where the trigeminal nerve often due to irritation from a vascular loop causes electrical shock like sensations usually in the v2 v3 um, region so um, but you're on the right track thinking are there other neuralgias other nerves that innervate the skin of the head. And there is something called occipital neuralgia. I think it's one of the C2 or C3 roots. And the patient will describe sort of electricity shooting from the occiput kind of up to the top of the head. And sometimes you can even get a sort of tunnel um, sign there. Um, so there are, you're right. There are many um, facial pain syndromes that involve um, other nerves that are not the trigeminal uh, nerve here. Although usually that's a more, patient describes sort of more electrical shock-like um, um, 
and probably you wouldn't have that rhinorrhea ear ear fullness. Um, so I'm not sure. You know, if you said just gave the um, 39 year old um, person um, with some unilateral um, uh, headache that kind of comes and goes, you'd sort of be thinking probably that this is going to be something benign in the migraine um, family. And some patients, when they're first presenting, will have some sort of background um, headache, or if they take a lot of analgesics, paradoxically, if they're taking a lot of aspirin, Tylenol, ibuprofen, they actually get a medication overuse headache. So many patients with intermittent episodic migraine or tension start taking daily um, uh, analgesics, and then they have this sort of background rebound headache with the superimposed um, headaches. Although again, that doesn't help us um, figure out what to do with this rhinorrhea and ear fullness. So um, could this patient have had some indolent infection pro progressing to meningitis? Um, other complications of ear infection could be a venous sinus uh, thrombosis. Um, and four months would probably be a long time, but um, those, um, those can present, even though it's a vascular etiology, not a sort of a thunderclap, because this is an sort of intracranial pressure from uh, venous, uh, disrupted venous outflow, right? So those patients develop a relatively acute but not sudden um, headache. So, so maybe this ear and nose um, aspect is sort of the, the, the trigger for whatever the neurologic um, syndrome uh, is here. But I agree, not, a, not, not quite enough information here to, to be more certain as both of you said. So, okay, Gabrielle, let's um, hear some more information and, and go from there. Yeah, so, so for more HPI, um, the patient has no nausea or vomiting, no precipitation of visual or auditory symptoms, no fever, no weight loss, no chills, no clear triggers um, of the acute exacerbations were identified, no tinnitus, no, no diplopia also. Um, for the medications, she has tried during these four months migraine medications with no effect, although she doesn't remember very well the name of the medications. And she, she also takes loxetine for major depressive disorder. Uh, for past medical history, um, she has a major depressive disorder when she was uh, 15 years old, and she has no previous diagnosis of migraine. She's a worker in a battery manufacturing company in Lima, Peru, and she travels every year to Ayacucho, and it's a city in the Peruvian Andes, where his parents have a little farm with cats, dogs, cows, chickens, ducks, two horses, and goats. And maybe you want the guys to stop there, and then I will give you the physical exam. Oops, uh, sure. So lots of interesting things here. Danya, what are you um, thinking here? Yes, that's, um, hmm. Well, um, with the, um, because uh, the patient does not have any visual or auditory symptoms, uh, quite a lot of, um, I believe secondary uh, causes. Uh, I don't think they're present. Uh, any, not sure. Uh, you're leading, since there's no visual or auditory symptoms associated, certain neurological or ischemic cause of the headache, I think I, I drew that out with it. Uh, no fever, weight loss. Again, the patient already had the, has the headache for four months. I don't think it's an inflammatory or infectious cause that is causing the headaches. However, the patient works in a battery manufacturing factory, maybe any toxins are the cause of uh, this headache, I'm not sure. And uh, Gabrielle mentioned that the patient is, uh, her, her family is uh, lives at a farm where there are a lot of cats, dogs, cows. So is there any association of Mm, liver, uh, sorry, echinococcus granulosis and hydatid cysts leading to a causing a space occupying lesion somewhere in the brain, leading to headache. 
I don't know, my thoughts are all over the place, but uh, that's something that clicked um, over here. Those are great know. thoughts. Yeah. So when we see that list of animals, of course, our infectious disease, um, <laughs> we open our infectious disease box of possibilities, right? And you can get in a kind of cockle um, cyst in the brain. Um, uh, common things being common, um, neurocysticercosis is very common in Peru. First presentation with seizure is pretty common, though many patients with neurocysticercosis um, report headaches as well. Um, Gabrielle didn't mention um, pigs in the list of animals, but um, still, you don't have to make contact with the pig. It's fecal oral spread, so you can make contact with someone else who made contact with the pig, and um, you can, can get that um, condition. Um, I don't know much about brucellosis, but if we really want to go animal by animal and think of all the things that can be caused, I'm actually, I think brucellosis can cause spinal spondylodiscitis. If anyone knows, tell me, I'm not sure if it can cause some type of chronic um, meningitis, but gee, whenever you hear animals and given in this much detail, it's hard not to start thinking about infectious etiologies and, um, you know, it can cause some framing bias, right? So, um, if we sort of go backward and just say, is this a primary or secondary headache disorder? There's also the morning report bias that if Gabrielle's just presenting migraine for us um, in the end, that's a very common um, thing and not likely to be presented at morning report, but you know, from a Bayesian reasoning perspective, right? A young person with intermittent um, headaches, uh, migraine would certainly be um, something um, you know, on the top of a differential and you'd be um, sort of trying to see if you get pulled away from that. On the other hand, if the problem representation here is a, you know, sort of um, subacute um, headache with possible infectious symptoms and a patient exposed to multiple animals, then you start wondering about um, infectious conditions. So um, when we think about meningitis, I think most of us, what we're thinking is about bacterial meningitis, this very acute fulminant syndrome from streptococcus pneumoniae or Neisseria meningitidis, right? But Meningitis actually has a very broad differential. Not all meningitis is even infectious. There are inflammatory meningitides. There's, um, uh, there's carcinomatous meningitis from metastases to the leptomeninges. Um, and then in, within infections, you can get bacteria, viruses, fungal, tubercular, syphilitic, um, and um, even parasitic. So um, bacterial tends to be a very acute meningitis. Viral tends to be very acute, but fungal, tubercular, um, uh, parasitic causes can be um, much more um, indolent and might not have, um, uh, can be much more indolent, I'll leave it at that, and may have um, some focal features um, on the exam if there's an abscess that's been formed, um, but not uh, necessarily. So um, let's stop there. So yeah, so some people define an entity as chronic meningitis, um, which is, I think, meningitis present for more than four weeks. So um, that's a very different differential than the sort of usual, is it bacterial or viral? Then you have long list of fungal, tubercular, syphilitic, um, parasitic, inflammatory, neoplastic, even drug-induced meningitis. Um, I think Bactrim can do it, IVIG can do it, too much NSAID can give you a toxic meningitis. And then I don't know what to do with the battery factory, what toxins could be there, um, something that's sort of being inhaled that could cause some sort of chronic headache, but it seems um, a stretch. And then um, fluoxetine or Prozac um, can cause reversible cerebrovasal constriction syndrome, but usually that's um, a brief period of sort of recurrent thunderclap headaches. And if she stopped taking fluoxetine, um, many patients get sort of a SSRI withdrawal syndrome that can have a prominent um, headache as well if she ran out or stopped taking it. So these are not necessarily things that are on the top of my <laughs> differential, but sort of trying to take each thing and, and see if we can force a Venn diagram with headache and see what comes up. But I think, um, well, I'll ask you, going into the exam, what are some of the um, things you're going to be looking for that might help us distinguish? Is this a, we're still asking the same question as from the beginning, right? Is this a primary headache disorder or a secondary headache disorder? And our antenna is up for secondary in part because it's going on for a while and in part because we heard about this very rich um, animal history, but that could just be a red herring, no pun intended. Um, what things would be looking for on the exam that can help us distinguish between primary and secondary headache disorders? Uh, either Hans or Danya, what would what what do you if you could only check? We're, we're going to do the whole neuro exam. So when I ask people, would you if you could check one thing? They say the neuro exam, and I 
always appreciate that. If there are, what are you, let me ask it this way. What are you looking for on the neurologic exam that might help us here? I'm not very certain about this, but if there are any sensory losses that are going with the uh, headache, maybe that is looking more like a secondary headache. Okay, so if there are any focal features on the examination, I'll broaden it from just sensory, right? So if this patient, if this patient has an asymmetric um, reflex, has a pronator drift on one side, has an upgoing toe on one side, you might say, oh, there's, there's something, right? There's some type of structural lesion. Um, could it be causing uh, this headache? Um, what else might you look for on the exam, Danya? Um, I would like to look at the uh, otoscopic exam, see if there's any, anything that's causing that fullness in the ear, and we can actually look at it. Yeah, it'd be nice to know um, what that ear looks like. Um, there's something else I would like to look inside. I was thinking about a fundoscopy as well. Yeah, exactly. How come, Hans? Why would you want to look back there? Uh, it would give us an idea of the intracranial pressure if we can see any dilation of the veins or edema. Yeah, so I want to get a look at that optic disc, right? Because if, um, if this patient really has a four-month headache with a elevated intracranial pressure, we should see some change in that optic disc, um, like papilledema, right? Now, papilledema takes time to develop. So some people, if the patient was presenting at the first presentation with a sudden headache and you said, oh, there's no papilledema, no, it can take some time. But after four months, if there's elevated intracranial pressure, we should see something back there. So I agree, I would want to do a detailed neurologic exam and see um, if there are clues here that there's some focal lesion hiding somewhere. The fundus will be helpful. And then be interesting to know what's going on um, in the ear. You'll have to help me with that. I don't look in ears too much anymore. Um, if we see a picture of a otoscopic exam from Gabrielle, um, but that as well. And then we would wanna look for meningismus, right? Is there stiffness um, of the neck? And that's not always present with meningitis, but if it's there, it can help you. And then Koenig and Brzezinski signs, with we, which we learned there's a JAMA rational clinical exam uh, paper on, does this patient have meningitis? And I think Koenig and Brzezinski signs are something like 5% sensitive, so pretty pathetic, but they're 95% specific or something like that. And I think this is probably because in Koenig and Brzezinski's time, people were presenting pretty late by the time they made it to the hospital with meningitis. And for those of you that work in settings where patients have to go a long way to find healthcare, you may see these signs much more commonly, and I have seen them much more commonly in resource limited settings, as opposed to in high resource settings where the patient calls the ambulance the first sign of the headache and they're in the hospital the same day, right? So um, signs of meningismus, um, fundoscopy, otoscopy, and then our neuro exam, I think are the things I agree with you that I'd be listening for here. Okay, Gabriel, what's on the exam? Yeah, so for the physical exam, uh, we have a temperature of 36.5 Celsius, respiratory rate of 18 per minute, heart rate of 90 per minute, blood pressure of 100 over 60, and saturation of oxygen 98%. General, the patient was alerted and oriented, and she has an adequate speech and gait. Um, we performed a fundoscopy which was normal. We didn't do, do an otoscopy. Um, cranial nerves evaluation normal. Motor, motor exam normal. Reflex test and sensory normal. And cerebellar, she has no dyspnea or dysmetria. So normal. Normal yeah, exam. Yeah, basically a, a normal exam. Totally normal exam. Okay, Hans, Danny, are we off the hook? No, I would say no. Okay, no, I agree no. with you. Why would you say no? Because of her symptoms. Her, her headache is just going, been going on and it's bothering her, so I can't just let loose. Now, I might not see an aneurysm in the fundoscopy, I would guess. And I can very well imagine that an aneurysm or even a space occupying mass would be something that will give rise to a normal neuro exam. Then we have normal vitals, which is very assuring that possibly she does not have a, an infection. So in that case, I would do some imaging as, um, well, first of all, the labs, but then some imaging. 
Yeah, I would say as a neurologist, first of all, some imaging and then the labs, but I, I agree, probably this patient will get sometimes, yeah, this is a, a pretty benign exam. And this is always what makes this exercise a little bit challenging compared to real life, right? Because when you're taking a history in real life, you're looking at the patient and your worry meter is going up or down, just looking at how healthy or how sick they look. And we're hearing that this patient, if you saw them, you know, walking outside, they would look totally normal to you, um, which um, uh, probably, you know, makes you a little less concerned for some of the serious etiologies of headache. But I would agree with you, Hans, that this history is not really crystallizing, obviously, around a primary headache disorder like tension or migraine, though those are both very common. And maybe there's some other explanation for this rhinorrhea and fullness, but the fact that it's, I think, um, I thought I saw in that history, but maybe I don't see it anymore, that um, there was some uh, relationship to this being at night or something like that. In any case, um, I agree. I'm not totally reassured by a normal exam here because the history is um, after sleeping. Thank you for whoever just highlighted that. I'm scanning a number of things at once. How about you, Danya? Are you um, worried about this patient? Not that worried. Do they need to go to the emergency room or if you're seeing them in the clinic, can you get your scan as an outpatient? What are you thinking? Yes, I, I am worried. Why? Because um, the neurological examination is, it looks normal, but the patient's symptoms aren't, they're not benign. I mean, they are worrisome. And again, with the rhinorrhea and everything, if I am to think about, again, the primary disorders, maybe I would think about one of the rare cases of cluster headaches, but then why for four months? It shouldn't be persistent, should be constant, and shouldn't be exacerbating, right? So again, I don't have anything more to add other than the same that we need imaging. Yeah, I agree with you. I would image this person. Whenever I get imaging or anyone I'm working with gets imaging, I always um, ask myself and ask my students and residents, right? Um, what do you think it's going to look like so that when it comes back, you can sort of check your gut reaction. I don't, I don't think I know in this, in this case, um, I think, well, I'll ask you, are we going to see anything on this imaging? Just, you can give me a yes or a no. You don't have to say what you think we're going to see. And then I'll tell you what I think. What do you think, Danya Hans? Are we going to see anything on CAT scan or MRI that Gabrielle and his team probably got? I can't really tell. <clears throat> no, I, I got just, um, a very good idea from this chat. Maybe she was overdoing her medications and she gets some, some problems there. Now in the imaging, because it's been going on for four uh, months, I would also do an angiogram if possible. Maybe we can indeed see something like a, a venous thrombosis or maybe we can see an aneurysm or maybe we can see something like a mask. At this point, we really don't know. We have to be open for everything. Yeah. And what do you think, Danya? Are we going to see something on this scan in this next aliqua? Honestly, with the way Gabriel has presented this case so far, I think he's going to surprise us with a normal MRI. <laughs> yeah, I have a sense here that there's nothing focal. We're hearing the patient looks pretty healthy, that the brain parenchyma at least is going to be normal. Although, I, again, I like to put my, my money down, right? And then, so if I'm surprised, I have an emotional valence to um, what I learned. Another thing, just to think Bayesian, we didn't hear the weight of this patient, but a young person more commonly in women who um, might have some features of a headache that's worse um, lying down, elevated intracranial pressure could be idiopathic intracranial hypertension, also called pseudotumor cerebri. Though when you say that to a patient has the word tumor in it, they get a little bit frightened. We didn't hear about some of the transient visual obscurations with bending down and back up. Um, and one of the things you always want to rule out in that condition is a venous sinus thrombosis, which can present very similarly as pseudotumor, as the syndrome of elevated intracranial pressure, but no focal findings, no mass on imaging. So I agree as a first pass, um, I would get imaging. Would I send this patient to the emergency room? I'm not seeing anything like that, but I would certainly be eager to, to see it. Um, and depends on your resources. A CAT scan is fast, but has radiation exposure and is less um, sort of sensitive for a lot of things. Probably an MRI as a first um, pass will give us um, a little more detail, especially since we're not sure about the brain parenchyma. Will we see meningeal enhancement? Will we see venous sinus thrombosis? Aneurysms, Hans, are usually very, very, very small. And so 
um, they can cause pressure on, uh, on um, cranial nerves and cause cranial nerve deficits. And many, I don't know if it's many, some patients who have aneurysmal rupture, subarachnoid hemorrhage will report that they had a very bad headache sort of recently called a sentinel headache. That's probably some little bleeding from that aneurysm, but the aneurysm itself um, as a sort of cause of a primary progressive four month headache, I would probably think a little bit less likely. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. Maybe we'll see stigmata of neurocystosarcosis, though will that explain this syndrome? It's, it's so common in endemic areas, it can be incidental. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd like to see some imaging and if we really don't have an answer there, I guess, and, and someone should look in the patient's ear. Uh, as a neurologist, I would ask for someone's help with that. And if we really don't have anything there, this patient may need a, a spinal tap and, um, and <clears throat> Or not? Yeah, let's see. Okay, Gabrielle, give us another out yeah. here. We're all stuck. Maybe, Thank you. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe, so the final aliquot is an image. Maybe, guys, uh, can I share my screen? And would you want to describe what you see? Sure. Um, so I think Maria and Rafa can maybe co host, or oh, I think sorry. you are on. <laughs> sorry about that, Gabrielle. Here you go. You are a co host. Thank you. All right. I have no idea what we're about to see. <laughs> okay. There's a red arrow in there, so that will help. Um, Danya or Hans, yeah. what are we looking at here? You can tell us. Um, you can tell us what type of um, anatomical thing we're looking at, whether it's axial, sagittal, coronal. You can tell us if you can. Is it T1 or T2? Is there a contrast? Um, and the thing the arrow is pointing at, I was hard to miss. Um, where is that? Anyone want to start trying to narrate it as a radiologist before we say what it might be? Maybe I'll, I'll do the radiology part, but don't ask me whether it's weight, T2 weighted or not. I wouldn't be able to tell. No problem. And then I'll let Hans describe the anatomical, uh, the, the type of lesion that he sees. Uh, all right. So in front of us, we have a coronal section and then a, um, so what's it? It's a, um, it's, it's not a sagittal it. section. It yeah. is a. Begins with an A. Trans yeah. Transverse or axial transverse section. Uh -huh. Axial section, right. And, um, what I see over here is, so this is, um, looks like, is it the, the brainstem that the lesion is in the area of? And um, again, I, I don't know what kind of imaging is this uh, in the MRI, what, whether it's T2 weighted or not, I won't be able to tell that. Okay. But it looks no. like it is vascular since, um, no, it's, I, I don't know, again, no, I shouldn't comment on that. Okay, um, excellent. So on the left is a coronal section, right? And people wonder, people say, why isn't the one on the right coronal? Because isn't a crown something that goes this way that looks sort of like, someone told me once, no, it's like the crown that the bishops wear that's sort of pointing up that if that thing sliced you, it would look, I don't know if that's true. Anyway, coronal on the left, um, axial on the right. And this is a T1 post contrast image. How do I know? That it's T1. It's a little hard um, to see here, but the um, gray matter is um, darker than the white matter T2. That's the opposite. And I know that it's contrast enhancing because there's contrast in vascular structures. There's a little contrast in the meninge in the um, ventricles, which is the um, choroid plexus. And then um, thank you, Gabrielle, for um, pointing to some of these um, aspects as well in the venous structures of the meninges. And as you said, in the region of the brainstem, so left and right are flipped just like a chest x ray, right? So there's a lesion that. Gabrielle is adding an extra arrow to here in the, um, at a region called the cerebellopontine angle. Well, this is a little bit lower because that looks um, sort of on the, at least on the right side, like the medulla, but I think it extends up. So is this lesion in the brain, do you think, or outside the brain, what we would call intraaxial or extraaxial? Because those have different differential diagnoses. So this is extra axial. If you look, it's a little hard to see on the uh, axial image, but if you look in the coronal image, you can sort of get the sense that the cerebellum 
in the brainstem, they are displaced, um, but not infiltrated. And you can sort of see the outline. I, I, it's a little hard to see on the slice on the um, left. And it's interesting, right? This is pressing on a pretty high real estate area, the ponds and medulla. There's a bunch of cranial nerves that come out there. Um, uh, certainly seven, eight would be around there in the cerebellopontine angle and the cerebellum. And yet this is small enough or it's been progressing slowly enough that the brain is just getting kind of squeezed aside and the patient doesn't seem to have any clear symptoms of this beyond the headache. So then the question becomes um, the differential diagnosis of a mass at the cerebellopontine uh, angle. And there's a couple of possibilities there and some of which are um, suggested a little more or less by the imaging. Do either of you know, and it's fine if you don't, we're getting into nuanced neuroradiology here, the differential diagnosis of a cerebellopontine angle lesion. I can give you a clue. What if the patient had presented with uh, hearing unilateral hearing loss, tinnitus, and uh, lower motor neuron pattern facial weakness? Yeah, that would be neurofibrillomatosis number two, something like this. Um, it can be seen in neuro... Say, go ahead, Daniel. Vestibular schwannoma, what about? Um, yeah, so you would think of a vestibular schwannoma, and Hans, you're right, if you saw those bilaterally, you could think of uh, NF2. Um, so yeah. That's, that's one. Say again, sorry? That is unilaterally? Yeah, this one, there's just, as far as we can tell, um, there's something on one side. So a vestibular schwannoma, you can get a schwannoma on any cranial nerve. I don't know why it likes the vestibular nerve so much. Usually those patients present with hearing loss, not ear pain or fullness, but we didn't ask the patient if it's just unilateral. Patients without thinking about it will put their phone on that side or might not notice um, that symptom. The other thing you can see in the cerebellopontine angle is a skull base meningioma. And you know the challenge on imaging, which uh, this is, uh, as, as always here, we're not scrolling up and down on the actual image to see each slice. Um, that sort of kind of dumbbell shape almost looks to me a little bit more like a schwannoma, um, although it's a little hard to say on one slice. A meningioma, well, so both will have homogeneous contrast enhancement, as you see here. The meningioma will often have a little dural tail of enhancement that sort of comes out of both sides. And the schwannoma kind of has a more, a little bit more of a quote dumbbell shape, which you sort of see on the, on the left there. Um, and like I said, you can get a schwannoma on any nerve and the ones that would be around there, sort of cerebellopontine angle, usually seven, um, eight, although if it gets big enough, you can hit five. And if it goes down far enough, you can start getting lower cranial nerves. So I guess I would probably say that's a schwannoma. Um, but um, it still doesn't explain rhinorrhea <laughs> and earfulness, and um, but does explain sort of a, you know, uh, why we thought there were enough red flags to image here, right? A progressive, unexplained headache making you think of a, a mass. Um, so tell us what happened next, um, Gabrielle. Yeah, um, as you said, Aaron, um, the differential were meningioma and schwannoma, but the neurosurgery team made a diagnosis of meningioma based on other image that I don't have. But after um, she was treated for the meningioma with gamma X-ray, but, but she didn't improve her headache uh, because after one week the treatment, uh, she uh, reported um, that the headache record. So the final diagnosis actually um, the, the neuro team made in the HPI of hemicrania continua based on the characteristics of the headache. And what I actually learned about this case is that we as medical students tend to learn hemicrania continua as a primary headache, but it can actually be secondary to a structural lesion such as meningioma. So the, the patient was prescribed with indomethacin and she has a pressure response to this medication. So the final diagnosis was hemicrania continua, so contrary to meningioma. Wow, very interesting case. And, so, and she was treated with radiation for that men meningioma rather than surgery? Yeah, yeah. A gamma, gamma a race with dexamethasone. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. So this raises an important point that even migraine headache can be secondary, right? So a patient can have a scintillating scotoma or a, a pulsating headache I saw a patient present like that who had had an occipital stroke. And for whatever reason, that region 
the symptomatology of the stroke was migraine, was the syndrome. So you can have, and then the, so hemicrania continua is one of the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, the tacks that includes cluster, includes um, sunct and suna. If you ever see a case, let me know. I've never seen a case either of those. Hemicrania continua and paroxysmal hemicrania. And they're characterized. I don't remember. Cluster are the longest. They're about three hours. Sunct and suna, the patients have hundreds of these little attacks a day, I think. And then paroxysmal hemicrania, maybe dozens or something. Um, there are tables of these that tell you all their little different features, but they're pretty uncommon. But the interesting thing is that hemicranian continuum and paroxysmal hemicrania can respond to endomethacin. That's part of how you diagnose them. And the other interesting thing is that, although usually they're non-lesional, these trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, um, it is recommended to image them. And um, the reason is because you can find, I think normally around the pituitary region is where it's more common to find um, pathology. So um, I think Maria said, Gabrielle has a really simple case here. Don't worry, you'll finish on time. I wouldn't call that a simple case um, by any means, but um, excellent um, case and very um, interesting case with a lot of twists and turns. All those animals turned out to be red herrings that we couldn't resist discussing the infectious diseases caused by each one, right? And I think big points here is that this is a young, otherwise healthy person with a new headache. You, when you see that on your list of patients to see, you think it's probably migraine or tension, but there were a number of red flags here that um, moved us away from that, right? And ultimately told us we need some imaging here and found um, a CP angle um, tumor. Excellent, well, thank you, Gabrielle. Wonderful discussion, Danya and Hans, about the very common presentation or very common condition of headache and the approach to it and then working through a, um, a complicated case. So if that's a simple case, Gabrielle, I will be in fear of your complicated case and make sure that there is not a meeting at 10 a.m. that I have to run to. So. Thank you all so much. I will leave you with um, Rafa and Maria for teaching points and um, we'll go on to my next meeting. Sorry about that, but thank you very much for volunteering and hope others will volunteer uh, next week. Have a good day. Oh, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Gabriel, presenting the case and thank you, Donia and Hans for discussing. So we had uh, patients with headaches for four months. So then the first questions that would come up to our mind would be, what is the age of the patient, the type of headache and the duration? It's all, all important to consider during the history. If, for example, if this was a elderly patient with sudden headache and focal neurologic deficit, we could think about stroke and TIA. But if this was a young patient with unilateral headache, or photophobia, phonophobia, we could think about migraine. When it comes to headaches, it's always also important to distinguish between primary and secondary causes of a headache. So our own uh, thought is about secondary headaches. We could uh, divide that based into inside of the heart, like tumor, head, neck, for example, ear, nose, teeth problems, or systemic conditions like the flu. And then we discussed about various types of headaches. For example, how could we identify vascular headaches? These are usually sudden with thunderclap, worst headache of my life, patients can see, can say, sorry. And then this is usually due to uh, severe arachnoid hemorrhage in the setting of aneurysm or arterial venous malformation. And even uh, use of amphetamines and cocaine that can lead to vasospasm. When it comes to mass occupying lesions leading to headache, we could think about elevated intracranial pressure. For example, headache worse in the morning that can awaken the patient leading to what we call brain orthopnea. And the background is also important in these patients. For example, if the patient is HIV positive, we could think about opportunistic infections leading to the headache or even tumors. Uh, neoplasias, we could think about metastasis. If this patient had a Lyme disease, we could think about meningoencephalitis or even otitis media can predispose to brain abscess that can manifest as headache. And then when it comes to headache, we always have to remember about the snow pneumonic. For example, as for systemic symptoms and for neurological uh, symptoms, or for onset, uh, other for other associated condition features like head trauma or illicit to drug use, P for previous headache, or it then um, it, all of these are red flags, and we could we should consider imaging the patients. But we saw that this patient actually had a lesion in the cerebellopontine angle, and we could think about two differential diagnoses: vestibular neuroma and also meningioma. In vestibular neuroma, it's uh, we could think about that this was bilateral NF2, and this is a shown cell divided with the tumor and typically arise from the vestibular portion of the vestibular cochlear nerve. And then the meningioma otherwise is actually typically found in a school-based meningioma, 
and it's uh, progesterone responsive, so much more common in, male, in females. And there's this growth for, for people who are taking the step one. It's usually we can find some woman bodies, which are those classifications. So thank you everyone. I hope everyone had a great time and I hope to see everyone tomorrow. Bye.